Okay. Welcome. So this is the second part of Chapter 18. We're looking at the role of central banks and what they, how they fit into this story of exchange rates. And so we're going to look specifically at exchange rate regimes and focus on um, fixed versus floating exchange rates, essentially. Um, but when we think about exchange rate regimes, there's uh, three basic types. As I said, there's a floating exchange rate. And the idea here is simply that um, market forces are going to be determining the exchange rate. And so in particular, exchange rates are going to be unimpeded by government intervention or central bank uh, intervention. Um, there's sort of an intermediary, which is referred to as a managed or sometimes it's called a dirty float. And the basic idea is that the central bank might occasionally intervene in um, foreign exchange markets and uh, uh, intervene to try to manipulate exchange rates if they get too far from some desired levels or um, occasionally central banks set up bands with which the, they can fluctuate. And once they get outside of those bands, then they might decide to intervene. And then a third type on the other extreme is a fixed exchange rate. So um, the basic idea here is that the government or the central bank is going to peg the exchange, the exchange rate um, to an anchor country, um, or they can also peg it to a basket of currencies. So uh, again, the idea is that the uh, Mexico might peg its peso to the U.S. dollar, or it could peg it to a value of a weighted value between the U.S. dollar and the Canadian dollar, um, and, and maybe um, uh, some other uh, currencies as well. And so these. Uh, Fixed exchange rates can take several forms, which I'll talk about a little bit later on, um, but there's basically the standard sort of uh, fixed exchange rate regime. Uh, I'll later refer to this as the de facto exchange rate regime, um, where there's no formal commitment mechanism. So the idea is that the central bank says, this is our peg, and this is um, you know, we're going to um, conduct monetary policy or conduct policy more generally. It doesn't have to be through monetary policy means, as we'll see. Uh, but they're going to conduct policy and, thing, and do things in such a way that they maintain that exchange rate regime, but there's no formal commitment. They can walk away from that at any time. Um, there's a stronger form of commitment, which is through a currency board, um, and then an even stronger one, uh, which is through what's referred to as dollarization, which I'll talk about uh, at the end. So we're going to focus on fixed exchange rates. Uh, floating exchange rates are real easy. As we talked about before, it's market, uh, um, it's market driven, so there's no mystery there. Um, so in terms of fixed exchange rates, the mechanics of them are such that the central bank is going to intervene uh, any time the exchange rate comes out of al alignment with its peg. And so what that means, as we've seen in previous videos, is that the central bank is going to buy or sell international reserves. So these central banks have uh, stores of, of, of uh, currency in foreign denominations, which it holds, and it can intervene in, in, in international uh, foreign exchange markets. Uh, to move exchange rates. And so it does that to try to uh, hit the exchange rate that uh, defines its peg in some ways. So we've seen that the, the process of intervening in, in foreign uh, exchange markets affects the monetary base. It can impact interest rates. And that, of course, uh, means exchange rate movements through um, changes in the demand for domestic denominated assets relative to foreign. And so the natural question is to ask, well, why, why, should we, why do countries peg? Why do they want to peg? Um, there's a couple reasons, which we'll get into um, uh, later on in another video. But they can beneficially tie the hands of pol policymakers that have a poor track record of inflation management. Um, so committing to a peg means that they can uh, keep inflation low more easily. Um, they can provide favorable exchange rate terms. And uh, of course, countries with large import sectors can benefit from exchange rate certainty. Um, and so that, of course, minimizes the risk um, to the value of the trade flows fluctuating based upon market uh, interest uh, exchange rates, rather. So we're going to look at two cases in terms of a fixed exchange rate and see how uh, the central bank manages the process in order to keep the exchange rate pegged. So the first example is if we have a, um, an overvalued exchange rate peg um, and the interest, uh, the exchange rate rather, falls below that peg. So in this case here, that E par, that's going to be our exchange rate peg. Okay. So the idea is that the uh, exchange rate might fall below that, right? And so we might end up here at a point like point 0.1. So the exchange rate falls below, and for reasons which we'll talk about in a minute, the peg is at 2, and the central bank wants to 
maintain that exchange rate at point two and at E par. So how we do this is that if the demand, uh, so as long as we're at the peg, as long as we're at demand level D2, then we're at the exchange rate peg and everything is fine. If demand falls below that to D1, for instance, well, what has to happen is the central bank is going to sell its, some of its international reserves. And what that means is that it's going to be, it's going to be buying domestic currency. So it's the amount of international reserves that the central bank holds declines. The amount of currency in circulation is going to be removed by an equal amount. And so what that means is that the monetary base is going to fall. That's going to be contractionary. And that, of course, is going to raise domestic interest rates in the, in the domestic economy. So as we talked about before, an, an increase in domestic interest rates then is going to result in an increase in the demand for domestically denominated assets. And so the central bank is going to intervene uh, and to raise demand back up to D2. And once it gets there, then we stop and everything is fine because we, of course, at that point will have reached our peg, the exchange rate peg. And so it's important to note, too, that in this process, in order to uh, get back to the peg, what happens is the central bank's um, amount of international reserves it holds is going to decline. And it also results in a decline in the monetary base. Okay. Now, it's important to keep in mind that as long as there's pressure on the exchange rate to devalue, the central bank is going to constantly have to intervene and do the same process of drawing down international reserves, pushing interest rates up, and pulling the demand back up in order to ensure that we end up at point two at that exchange rate E par in order to maintain that exchange rate. Now, that will be important um, uh, in a few minutes when we look more closely at this process. So in terms of the overvalued exchange rate, um, the question is why would countries want to do that? Well, um, for one thing, it, it results in higher interest rates in general. So that can help attract foreign capital and foreign investors to come in. It can increase um, foreign direct investment. Um, and so typically you would think of this uh, as being a process in which emerging market countries might uh, want to um, uh, engage in. The problem, of course, that I just sort of hinted at is that central banks can run out of international reserves. Central banks have a finite amount of these international reserves, and they can't print foreign currency, right? So they can only print their own currency and, and um, increase their own. Uh, they can only print their domestic currency. So they're limited by the amount of international reserves in terms of maintaining this process of keeping exchange rates propped up. And so if it turns out that uh, the fundamentals of the currency um, are misaligned too far from its fundamentals, so in the previous uh, slide we had E par, if the exchange rate continuously and persistently falls away from that, then eventually the central bank um, will run out of ammunition, will run out of international uh, reserves, um, and can't, can no longer um, defend that peg. And so that's what's referred to as a speculative attack, um, in which case you can have a rapid exchange rate devaluation. Um, you get a sharp devaluation in the currency because once the central bank runs out of reserves, it can't do anything uh, at that point to prop up that overvalued exchange rate. Um, and so the problem with this is that in emerging market countries, a lot of the debt that uh, is held in those domestic economies is denominated in foreign terms, specifically in dollar or maybe euro or yen terms. And so when this happens, uh, the, the, the real debt burden of these emerging market countries rises sharply because of, um, because of the mismatch that uh, the currency uh, and the debt have. And so this can lead to a balance of payments crisis that we uh, talked about a little bit in um, one of the previous videos. And so there's, so there's some examples of uh, speculative attacks. For instance, the um, exchange rate mechanism for Britain in 1992, uh, Mexico in 1994. A lot of East Asian countries um, experienced um, balance of payments crises and speculative attacks in uh, the late 1990s. And you can see in the data, actually, uh, sharp devaluations that occur because they run out of uh, reserves. So we can look at uh, the flip side of this, which is an, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, an undervalued exchange rate peg. So in this case, with an undervalued exchange rate peg, 
that E par, that's going to act as our peg. And so anytime the demand uh, rises up above that and the exchange rate goes up above, the central bank is going to reel it in and pull back down the demand curve. And it's going to pull it back down so that we end up back at point two and we end up back at that peg. So to, to, in this case here, what happens is there, um, there, there's a natural inclination for the peg to move away from point two, maybe to point uh, one. So as demand increases to D1, what's going to have to happen is the central bank is going to have to end up buying international reserves. And the way that they do that is by printing currency in order to buy up international reserves. So it increases the amount of currency in circulation that raises the monetary base that's expansionary that drives down domestic interest rates. So relative to foreign interest rates, a decline in domestic interest rates means our demand for assets, domestic assets, is going to go down. And so that results in the exchange rate uh, depreciating back to the pegged level, E par. And so as long as nothing else changes, we just sit at that peg and every, uh, uh, everybody is happy, including the central banks. But again, the extent to which there's upward pressure on the demand curve to pull up away from that peg, that's going to require constant intervention by the central bank in order to maintain that peg. And so as long as that, that, that persistent pressure is maintained, the central bank is going to have to, in this case, increase its, the volume of its international reserves, its holdings of international reserves go up. And in order to do that, it has to introduce more currency in circulation or reserves. The monetary base is going to rise. <clears throat> so in this case, why would countries want to do um, this type of a, an undervalued exchange rate peg? Um, well, it artificially depreciates the currency. So it, in the previous example, the E-peg, the, the E-par rather, that was below what, say, market forces might be trying to pull it up above. Um, and so because of that, you would have an artificially depreci depreciated currency. Um, that means its exported goods are cheaper abroad. So exports go up, imports are going to fall. And so you get um, a, perhaps a, a beneficial effect on net exports. Um, in addition to this, you can develop and protect manufactured or traded goods sectors um, from international competition by keeping your exchange rates artificially low. Um, and on top of that, you can also accumulate vast amounts of international reserves. So through this process of making sure your currency is undervalued, you also print up a bunch of money. And also the flip side of that is you accumulate um, international reserves. There's also some pro potential problems with this process. Acquiring large amounts of international reserves can be risky, um, and it also can have low returns. So again, you're holding assets that are uh, denominated in foreign terms, and so that's subject to a variety of risks. Um, and it's all, the process is also potentially inflationary. Keep in mind, when you're accumulating these international reserves, you're also increasing the, mon the domestic monetary base. And as we've seen and we've talked about in previous chapters, that's potentially inflationary. Um, and then the flip side of this, too, is that it can create trade problems. So these persistently low, um, artificially low currencies, they can create favorable uh, trade um, patterns for your country, but it can uh, rankle your um, uh, trade partners and make them uh, less competitive. And so that can lead to trade disputes, political problems, um, or otherwise. And so um, this example is, in a lot of ways, indicative of what China did through much of the 2000s by acquiring a vast amount of international reserves, primarily dollar-denominated assets. Um, and so they're also subject to these potential problems. Um, and there was occasional trade disputes uh, among the US and other uh, industrialized nations uh, as a result. <clears throat> so how, how are we to think about exchange rate pegs? Well, um, on the one hand, they seem really handy because we can control the value of uh, the flows of exchange rates, and there are certain benefits to that. Um, but they're not a panacea for policymakers. So in other words, they don't solve the central bank's problems and the broader economy's problems. Um, and so if we think about, uh, from a policy perspective, what we'd like to have, well, in an ideal economy, it'd be nice to have free capital mobility. Um, and the reason why is because that creates efficient allocation of capital. Um, which has beneficial impacts on growth. Um, we'd like to be able to have fixed exchange rate regimes because that helps us to uh, 
sort of favorably manipulate the, the value of trade flows. Um, and then we'd also be able, like to be able to have policy that we can use to stabilize our economy to any and all shocks that occur. Um, and so the problem, the fundamental problem, is that we can't have our cake and eat it too. So in other words, given these three sort of ideal uh, things that we'd like to accomplish as uh, policymakers, it turns out we can only do two of those three. And that's what this um, policy trilemma is referring to. Uh, it's sometimes also referred to as the impossible trinity. So as policymakers, we can only choose two of those three objectives to achieve. So to give you some example, um, so again, so the punchline here see, is, well, that's really unfair. I want everything. Well, you can't have everything. You can only have two of those three things. So let's look at these. Well, I want fixed exchange rates and an independent monetary policy. So why can't I have free capital mobility as well? Well, let's think about this. If we have free capital mobility, that means that that's going to have impacts on domestic interest rates, which are also going to impact exchange rates. And so the only way we can deal with this is to limit the capital mobility because, as it turns out, our monetary policy is, has to be used independently to try to address shocks or other weaknesses in the economy. So the only way to achieve this is through limited uh, to limit capital mobility. So we can't have free capital mobility as well as those other two. Um, so let's look at this another way. Well, suppose I want fixed exchange rates and, and free capital mobility. Well, as we talked about before, free capital mobility means interest rates are going to be impacted. That's going to impact exchange rates. And so if we want to keep our exchange rate fixed, then we have to use monetary policy to constantly intervene in order to keep the, the peg at its uh, desired level. And so that necessarily means we can't use monetary policy to address uh, shocks to the economy separately from keeping exchange rates pegged. What about the, the third case? Well, suppose I want independent monetary policy and free capital mobility. Well, again, free capital mobility is going to lead to changes in interest rates as uh, capital moves between countries. That, affects imp um, that impacts exchange rates. And so, as we talked about before, well, monetary policy is going to be busy uh, chasing shocks to the economy and trying to deal with those things. And so it can't uh, address this exchange rate uh, movements. And so exchange rates are just going to have to adjust um, as the, 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 the uh, relief valve, so to speak, um, because of these capital movements. So this summarizes um, this uh, policy trilemma. And so this gives you some examples of um, the different setups. So in the case of the US, as I mentioned before, they choose to have an independent monetary policy and free capital mobility, and they just let exchange rates float freely. In the case of China, they've uh, opted recently uh, to uh, limit capital mobility, and that gives them the ability to fix, excuse me, fix their exchange rates. And it also gives them the ability to independently address shocks or weaknesses in the economy through monetary policy changes. But again, it requires um, uh, limits to how much capital moves in and out of the country. And then the, the third case here, is the example is Hong Kong. And here, Hong Kong is an example of free capital mobility and fixed exchange rates. And so in this case, they're giving up their monetary policy independence. So they don't have a lot of autonomy in terms of um, when shocks occur to the economy, uh, being able to use policy to address those shocks. Thank you.